OK. Um, well, one program note, um, title is uh, Ways and Relevance. Certain technical difficulties forced us to like change the order. It's going to be relevance and ways. Relevance if ways at all. We'll see what happens. OK, relevance. So the concept of sufficiency has had a very long run in philosophy. We all know about the principle of sufficient reason and the idea that premises of a valid argument should be sufficient for the truth of the conclusion. Uh, the reasons for an action should suffice to make the action uh, reasonable. Truth makers, Armstrong says, should um, suffice for the truth of what they're truth makers of, and so on and so forth. Um, a common complaint about just the pure use of sufficiency in explicating these sorts of notions is that if you think about just x suffices for, for y, x suffices for y is kind of monotonic in its first element. If x suffices for y, and then, then you can add some stuff to x, and it'll still suffice. You can't make x stop sufficing for y by adding additional stuff. Whereas the notion of causation doesn't seem to be like that. You know, Socrates died um, because of drinking the hemlock, not because of drinking the hemlock and then mopping his brow afterwards. Okay, but that's that's not captured by sufficiency because his drinking the hemlock and mopping his brow afterwards was just as sufficient uh, as his drinking the the hemlock. Um, so one thing you could try to do here um, would be to sort of, well, the natural counterpart to sufficiency is necessity. Maybe we should say that, you know, causes ought to be necessary and su sufficient and necessary for their effects, or premises of a good argument should be sufficient and necessary for the truth of a conclusion. But that actually reaches way too far because it's just not the case that an effect could only have had that one cause or that the conclusion of a valid argument could only have been reached in that exact way. So sufficiency asks too little. Sufficiency and necessity asks too much. Um, what are we going to do? Um, well, Hume worried about this. Hume uh, was all about sufficiency in the treatise of human nature. Um, but later, when he gets to the inquiry, he worries that this allows causes to get too big. And of course, he's particularly concerned that in trying to sort of say what causes what might seem to be what may be called a miracle, we don't postulate an infinite cause if a finite cause would have done it. And he says things like the following. He says, uh, blah, blah, blah. We cannot ascribe to the cause any qualities but what are exactly sufficient to produce the effect. And he says as well, if we exactly proportion the cause to the effect, we shall never find in it any qualities that support conclusions concerning any other work by this artist. That's the reference to the to um, uh, the infinite being, because those would take us somewhat beyond what is needed. So that's actually a very clever solution to the problem that I initially raised. Sufficiency asks too little. Necessity, when you put it together with sufficiency, asks way too much. But how about this? This is Hume's way out. I'm going to, so anyway, so that what, he, what he's aiming at, I should say, is like, so. Causes ought not to incorporate extraneous details. If you've got any, if you've got any relevant logician bones in your body, you think that the, the premises of, an, of a good argument ought not to contain stuff in whose absence the conclusion would still follow. Um, you don't want to stick random stuff into people's reasons for doing things that wasn't really a factor in what made it reasonable or perhaps a consideration that they, that they um, contemplated. Um, and truth makers, Armstrong says, ought to be commensurate with what they make true and discerning. And pretty much everybody from Hume on tries to understand this notion of commensurate, discerning, and so on and so forth, and keeping irrelevant fluff out in a certain way. So I'm going to call that Hume's, Hume's um, package, the Humean package. And it has two parts. First, P. X is proportional to Y. I'm going to be incredibly kind of uh, vague and flexible about what exactly X and Y are. I hope it doesn't matter if it doesn't. I'm sure we can talk about it later. X is proportional to Y if and only if, first, X suffices for Y. I'm also going to be pretty vague about what sufficing for is. That's not going to be the key issue. Second, if X prime, which is part of X, suffices for Y, then X prime equals X. In other words, nothing less than X um, suffices. So if something less than or equal to X suffices, then it's got to be X itself. I'm putting it that way for a particular reason that you'll see. So that's the idea of proportionality. Basically, x is proportional if um, everything in it is, so to speak, earning its keep. 
because if you'd struck any of it from x, you would wind up with a thing that was no longer sufficient for y the way that x by hypothesis is sufficient. Um, and then the notion of relevance or helpfulness or counting in favor of um, comes in, that's the second clause, h for helpfulness. z is relevant or helpful to, helpful to the cause of or a reason for y just in case z is part of some x that's proportional to y. So the idea is x doesn't have a relevant junk Therefore, if z is part of x, that tells us that z is not irrelevant uh, junk. So that's the sort of broadly Humean explanation of relevance. Proportionality is minimal sufficiency. Relevance is figuring in an x that is proportional to y. Um, so is minimal sufficiency the key to relevance? It absolutely is not. And I think this is sort of increasingly recognized, widely recognized these days. Um, a non-minimal condition, one with extras, can be wholly helpful, not have any extra stuff in it. Um, uh, so the slogan here is, it is okay to get extra help, help beyond what you strictly need. It's okay, you could, it, things that provide extra help, things in whose absence the consequence or the effect or whatever still would have obtained, uh, um, needn't sort of hang their head in shame. They're not irrelevant just because, they're not along for the ride just because in their absence you'd still have had the, the same uh, results. So here's a couple of ex examples. The first example is, um, um, first example, well, so Hume's um, inquiry, I believe, came out in 1748. The big challenge I want to talk about to Hume's notion of proportionality, where, which occurs in the inquiry, um, also, at least the challenge was launched in 1748 in a kind of a strange way. So in 1748, uh, a man named John Newton, uh, returning from something like a period of slavery in, in Africa, um, was caught in a storm off the coast of somewhere in Ireland, and um, uh, he had a shipboard conversion. The ship almost went down. He prayed and said he would be religious if da 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 da. Shortly after that, the sort of cargo miraculously shifted and blocked the hole. And this, so the ship, you know, didn't go down. He arrived at his destination. Uh, a few years later, um, it took him a while actually to, for the conversion to completely go through, but a few years later, <laughs> he wrote the song Amazing Grace, which should be better known by philosophers because one of the verses of Amazing Grace contains an anticipation of Dedekind's definition of infinity. And here it is in the, in the margin here. The verse I, I have in mind is, when we've been here 10,000 years, bright shining like the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we had just begun. So Dedekind defines a set as infinite if it's sort of uh, equinumerous with a proper subset of itself. And that's exactly what, what's going on in this verse. After 10,000 years, there's still just as many. So, the, he's broadly hinting that the number of days to come is, is infinite. I'm not sure if that's canonical doctrine, but we, we'll go with that. We'll just assume the number of days to come is, is, is infinite. So let's suppose that God is pleased if and only if he has praised infinitely many uh, days. So then it would seem like being praised every day should, should please God, right? But no, it's not minimal because, of course, you can take away, you could start, and perhaps this is what Newton was, was getting at. Why do we have to start now? We could just sort of like relax for 10,000 years and there will still be just as much time for all the, you know, the sufficiently many days of praise after that, still be infinitely many days of praise. So um, it seems like we have a failure of proportionality by the Humean, pa in the terms of the Humean package, if we say, well, what pleases God is if we sing his praises every day starting uh, uh, now, because that's more than, we could skip today, we could skip the first 10,000 years, we could skip any finite number of days, and we'd still have infinitely many days of praise, and so God ought still to be uh, uh, pleased. And of course, there is no minimal uh, 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 subset of an infinite set, which is, there is no minimal infinite subset of an infinite set, and so if we're really going to demand this sort of minimality idea, which is there under the definition of proportionality, you're not going to be able to find a, gauze, a cause for God's pleasure. He's, you know, why he's pleased at being praised that many uh, days. So 
presumably praising God every day is helpful to the cause of pleasing God or making God happy, but not because it figures in a minimal sufficer. There is no minimal sufficer in this case because of the role of infinity. Here's another example that, that um, is, is related to a paradox of, of Zeno's that I've heard described as Zeno's metrical uh, paradox. So a sphere takes up space, say a sphere, let's say in three-dimensional space, say, uh, let's say it has measure one. Where does that measure come from? Well, the sphere is made of points. Actually, the problem I'm about to mention could, I, I think it's important to, to allude to Whitehead at some point in, in these lectures. Uh, the problem I'm about to mention might be a reason for thinking that space is not made of points, but is actually, as Whitehead thought, points are kind of uh, the limits of, you know, decreasing concentric uh, spheres, they're just kind of, well, I don't know, you know what Whitehead, anyway, he didn't believe in points. He thought that while you really, that, that, that everything you wanted to say about points, you could, you could say sort of better by talking about sort of uh, uh, concentric uh, uh, sequences of, uh, of spheres. Anyway, so here's the paradox. The sphere takes up space. It has measure one. The component points of the sphere are helpful, surely. I mean, there's nothing else there. Right? So if the points aren't helpful, nothing, I don't, it's a miracle that the sphere ever managed to have measure one. But of course, as we know, if you, in measure theory, each point has measure zero because you can, you can enclose each point within an arbitrarily small sphere. And the measures of arbitrarily small spheres get closer and closer to zero. And you've got the, 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 the measure of a particular point is trapped beneath all those numbers converging on zero, so the measure of a point is zero. I think the, the, the Zeno paradox that, that um, I'm alluding to is something like this, you know, uh, you know, the measure of a whole should be the sum of the measures of the parts, but the measures of the parts in this kind of case are each zero. So where did the measure of the whole come from? That it's a measure one, where did that actually uh, come from? My thing is a little bit different. Um, um, None of the points in the sphere would be missed. There is no such thing as the minimal subset of the sphere, which, re which still has measure one. You could always take more points away, and you still have measure one. So it's whatever we have in mind when we think, look, the points are helpful. If they're not helpful, nothing is, because it's all points. Um, whatever we have in mind, whatever sort of intuition is being, is being sort of tugged at when we say this kind of thing, it doesn't have to do with minimality. So what does it have to do with? That's the question. So the first moral I want to draw from these examples is minimality had better not be required for helpfulness, because um, you can't always get minimality. And you don't want to sort of give up the right to say that certain things were helpful to a certain outcome just because you can't find a minimal sufficient basis for the outcome. But a second moral is that minimality ought not to be required even where you can get it. So here's some examples or an example of that. Um, I don't know whether anyone else encountered this fact in David Wiggins' Sameness and Substance. I think that's where I found it, unless it was something by Geach, uh, that the Pope's crown, at a certain point, not anymore, was made of three smaller crowns. Um, and uh, 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 the head, at a certain point, of the Ottoman Empire, Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, not to be outdone, uh, made a crown with four crowns. You can't, that's what's on the side there. He had, you, can, you can't quite make it out, but I assure you, you know, maybe you can make it out enough. There's, so Suleiman's crown was made of four crowns. Now, consider the hypothesis that there are crowns. Okay? What would be a truth maker for that hypothesis? Well, according to the minimality uh, constraint that's part of proportionality, um, Suleiman's full crown, four-part crown, is not suited to play the role. It's not that it doesn't have some minimal parts that are also sufficient. You could take each one of the individual crowns and they'd be sufficient. But it's not as though we think, oh, Suleiman, you really overdid it. What you've got on your head is not a suitable truth maker for there are crowns because it's sort of, it's over the top. It has more crowns than you need. Surely, uh, you know, we have the feeling that whatever else might be objectionable about what Suleiman has done, it's not that he has like miss, missed the mark as far as providing a truth maker for there are uh, crowns. Um, so that's one problem from the Humean package. A, that you can't always, it requires minimal sufficiency. Uh, one part of the problem is you can't always get minimal sufficiency. And the other part is even when you can get it, you don't always want it. 
it's, it doesn't speak to any sort of conceivable explanatory need to insist that we kind of narrow down to one of the four crowns that are sort of stacked together on Suleiman's head. Here's another problem, um, hyperintentionality. So Humean helpfulness, at least on the face of it, helpfulness as defined by P and H there, um, is intentional. So if X and Y are necessarily equivalent to X star and Y star, then X is proportional to Y only if X star is proportional to Y star, because sufficiency and minimality on the face of it are uh, intentional. So is relevance intentional or helpfulness intentional? So the answer is no. So here's an example on the Y side coming from what we just said. Let's take his, let Y be his praise is sung infinitely many days. That is true in the same worlds as it is sung infinitely many days after, should have said April, 12,016, waiting the, the, the indicated uh, 10,000 years. So singing every single day, that's X, is helpful to singing infinitely many days, but it's not helpful to singing infin infinitely many days starting in 12,000, right? Because the initial 10,000 years are, don't contribute in any way to the truth of we sang infinitely many days um, starting in 12,000. 12,016. Here's an example on the X side. This is loosely based on an example of, of uh, Kit Fine. So suppose that Eve cannot remember what God said about what she could eat. Okay, uh, assumption here. The, in the Garden of Eden, there, you know, of course, there's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's the tree of life. Well, let's just postulate there is one apple on the tree of knowledge of good and evil. I call it bad apple. Okay, and then there's infinitely many apples on the tree of life. Okay, so Eve goes to the serpent and says, I can't, what, it is, what was it that God says? And the serpent says, you know, I can't remember exactly, but I remember it was logically equivalent to this. You may eat infinitely many apples. And um, she says, okay, great, and she eats infinitely many apples. Well, you know the story, she eats the bad apple as well, and, you know, the rest is history. She goes back to the serpent, this is not recorded, but I, I think it's a good inference. Uh, she goes back to the serpent and says, you said that, God said I could eat infinitely many apples. The serpent says, no, 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 I said something. He, he permitted something equivalent to that, which is you may eat infinitely many apples distinct from bad apple. When I say you may eat infinitely many apples distinct from bad apple, I'm not saying you may eat infinitely many apples, but you may not eat bad apple. That would not be equivalent. It's just that the ones that you are given permission to eat are infinitely many, each of which is distinct from bad apple. That's what God really said. Okay, that's what you may do. Um, and so X is uh, truth, the truth of um, you take infinitely many apples apart from bad apple. That's helpful to say Eve did what she was told, but the truth of X star, which is necessarily equivalent, uh, you take infinitely many apples, uh, uh, period, is, is, is at least worrisome as a basis for Eve did what she was told. So a couple more examples like this. Um, fractals. So a fractal is a geometrical figure that um, contains isomorphic copies of itself all the, all the way down. I mean, that follows from it contains isomorphic copies of itself. You just keep on getting the same fractal down, 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 down as, 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 uh, as, as much as you turn the, the sort of uh, magnification up. Um, now, th on the, on, in the margin on the right-hand side, underneath the snake thing, there's a tree which, if done in full detail, would be a fractal. Um, so you can look at the tree as a whole, and then you can look at the left branch of the tree. And if you just sort of focus your, your attention on that left branch, it's completely it's supposed to be completely isomorphic to the whole tree. The tree contains a perfect copy of itself. And of course, you can do the same thing for that perfect copy, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the following is certainly true. Um, there are fractals. And this would seem to be a really good account of, of, of how and why it's true. This tree is a fractal. Now here's something that is not a good account of why it's true that there are fractals. This tree is a fractal and Sparky is a dog. That's not a good account. Why? Well, your first thought is, well, because it has this extra stuff in whose absence, it would still be true. You still have a sufficient condition for there are fractals, namely, Sparky is a dog. You could knock that out. You still have a sufficient condition for there are fractals. But if that can't be it, because you could knock any m amount of the tree out and you'd still have a sufficient condition for there are fractals. So the, the, the problem, whatever it is with Sparky as a dog, whatever it is that makes that irrelevant, it's not what you 
are inclined to think. You know, the Gilbert and Sullivan kind of story, you know. It, you know uh, they none of them be missed can sometimes be true, even if each of them is, in fact, uh, helpful to the, to the, to the cause. Um, and if you think about it, the Dedekind notion of infinity is a kind of a fractal notion, too, because what it is to be an infinite set is to have an infinite set buried inside you. And of course, the same thing will hold with that infinite set. What it is for it to be infinite is to have another infinite set buried inside of it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the um, Sellers argue somewhere that that naive notion of color is, a, he says, dissective in the sense that a red expanse, you divide it in half, you should still have two red expanses. You divide those in half, you should still have two red expanses on each side, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, so here's, here's an analogy to this situation. So it's true that you know, a good example of why something is true would normally be minimal. That's a pretty good marker for when it doesn't, you know, when it's free of irrelevant junk. Um, but look, the, f also, the following is, is, is also true. Good examples of things are normally visible. And if I want to, you know, I say, oh, look, you know, there's somebody who, um, uh, uh, you know, can, can, can recite every digit of, of pi. You say, where is he? He's right here. He's invisible. That's a problem for the example, right? Uh, <laughs> good examples are normally visible. But what about examples of invisibility? Someone say, if I say, oh, here's an example of invisibility, you can't say, I don't accept that. That's not visible. So, well, it better not be visible. It's an example of invisibility. And likewise here, uh, you better not be minimal for these fractal type concepts, because if it was minimal, then it wouldn't be an example of what it was supposed to be an example. Uh, of. Um, okay, so if minimality isn't doing the work, this, this, um, yeah, so what I'm saying so far is intuitively speaking, from the point of view of explaining why it's true that there are Fs, it's not cause for regret in many cases that the F, that the truth maker you suggest isn't minimal, right? So if someone says there are fractals, and I give you this tree as an example of a fractal, th th there isn't any sort of feeling of, of, of longing, too bad it isn't minimal, right? Because it's supposed to not be minimal, right? You wouldn't want, there's no explanatory need that would be sort of served by trying to find a minimal. So it isn't like one of those like pro tanto things where, you know, you ought to, you know, it, it ought to be a certain way. Unfortunately, there's sort of overriding reasons on the other side, but still there's grounds for regret in the fact that you weren't able to help your friend or whatever. There is no grounds for regret in the fact that your example of a fractal is not minimal. You're not, there's not some like, you're not still kind of pining after a minimal fractal which you somehow can't find. Um, okay, so, but the rejection of minimality leaves us with no way of understanding relevance, not even the bad way that we've just been considering. And we don't really have a plan B. How are we supposed to understand relevance if done in this way? So that's what I want to talk about next. So take, again, he has praised infinitely many days. Um, this has an unending chain of progressively weaker sufficers. Every day from today he is praised. Every day from tomorrow on he is praised. Every day from the day after that he is praised, and so on. Um, and a natural thought about these is the, 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 the weaker ones, the ones sort of, so to speak, closer to being minimal, are no better. There's no advantage to saying, if I say, look, here's why God has praised him for many days. We praised him from today on. You say, you could have done better than that. Skip today. You know, no, nobody thinks that is doing better. Okay, so smaller is not always better from the point of view of having uh, a wholly relevant um, 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 X. Let me give one more example like this. So suppose there are two, two Sparkies, Sparkies, a dog, Suppose there's a big one that includes like loose, unattached fur that could easily kind of be brushed out if you brush Sparky. And then there's a smaller one that just has the fur that's on tight. And let's just suppose that these are both, these are both dogs. And we want to make it true that there are dogs. Okay. Is there any conceivable reason for preferring little Sparky to big Sparky as a truth maker for there are dogs? Because it's, look, little Sparky is a little bit smaller, so it's closer to being minimal. There's, there's no conceivable reason for preferring little Sparky in that kind of uh, case. Or if someone says, there are periods of time. So well, here's one from now until now. I say, oh, you could have done much better than that. You, know, you could have done half of that would still have been, you know, again. Okay, so, um, so the notion that 
we seem to be sort of grasping at here is sometimes x and x prime, even though x prime is strictly speaking part, a proper part of x, it's not a proper part in a way that y cares about. We really should be interested in a notion of minimality where y is concerned, okay? Y doesn't care, you know, there are dogs doesn't care about how much hair is on the dog, okay? So that's sort of, so any gains you might make on the sort of minimality front by cutting out hair, that's no advantage from the point of view of there are dogs. Um, and so that's the idea I want to uh, pers uh, pursue, that really what we should be saying is not that there's no x prime that's strictly less than x that's also sufficient, there's no prime that's strictly less than x in the relevant respects, the respects that y uh, cares about. Uh, here begins a long period of anthropomorphism. I'll, 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 I'll leave it to you to judge whether we ever get out of that period. But I'm going to be using this notion of what y cares about. There are certain kind of economies from a general, you know, from a, from a, a sort of a God's eye point of view, you're making something smaller, that aren't really economies from the point of view of verifying y. They're, on a, they're along an axis that is not relevant to how and why. Um, y is, is true. So here's, if we knew what it meant to say that x prime is the same as x where y is concerned, um, I write that x prime equivalent sub y uh, to x, um, then we could refine p, the Humean definition of proportionality as follows. You'd have p1, x is proportional to y if and only if, x suffices for y, and for all x prime that are part of x, that are also sufficient for y, instead of saying x prime is equal to x, we now say x prime is just like x where y is concerned. Okay, it might be smaller than x, but in an irrelevant way, in a way that doesn't confer any advantages from y's perspective. Um, so take there are infinitely many electrons. It's about size in the how many sense. There are infinitely many electrons. It's about how many electrons there are. It's not about which electrons there are. So even though we could, supposing there are infinitely many, many electrons, we could take all of them, or we could take all of them except for this one, okay? Um, that is a way of shrinking the truth maker, but it's not a way that um, is relevant to the subject matter of there are infinitely many electrons. Because that statement does not say there are infinitely many electrons, namely these ones. It's sort of indifferent to the identity of the electrons, and nothing is lost how many electrons there are wise when you knock out uh, the, one, the one right here. So that's, that's, that's a first thought. I'm just trying to sort of build a constituency for this idea of like we better try to understand what x prime is equivalent sub y to x uh, means. Here's another reason. So caring about, uh, just thinking of the human notion of caring about a thing or wanting a thing, is hyperintentional notion. You may have heard this. I'm sorry to populate the world with yet another cute Jewish saying, but here's one. If you want your dreams to come true, don't sleep. Okay. Well, there is, so, so what, what, does that, what does that tell us? Well, I do want my dreams to come true. Wanting my dreams to come true is equivalent to not having any dreams that aren't true. Well, the second goal could be realized by cutting down the number of my dreams, right? So, that the, so these two things are logically equivalent. All my dreams should come true. Nothing untrue should be dreamed by me. But it seems like I want the first. I don't want the second. I'm not interested in, I'm not trying to pursue the truth of all my dreams uh, shall come true by way of, uh, you know, not sleeping, say. That's not one of the ways I have in mind. Another example that people, well, that, 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 that I sometimes give is, you know, so the goal of science, let's suppose, some very naively construed is, you, you know, um, you, you want to believe all truths. If something is true, then we want to believe it. Well, believing all truths is the same as if something is untrue, then you, uh, you don't believe it. Um, the second goal could be achieved in the following way. Suppose there is one part of nature we really don't understand. We, we're unable to form true beliefs about it. Simple. Just destroy that part of nature. Now all your beliefs are going to be true because there's nothing left to be the thing that you, didn't that you weren't able to form true beliefs about. That, of course, is not that is not cricket from the point of view of scientific method, I believe, um, based on my observation of science, scientists. Okay. Um, um, okay. Uh, 
So, so carrying about is a hyperintentional notion. Switching a bit closer to our example from before, Eve followed the rules. Take that, let that be our why. It's sort of happier uh, if she eats infinitely many apples distinct from bad apple than if she eats infinitely many apples, period. It's pure gratification from the point of view of Eve did what she was supposed to, to be told that she ate infinitely many apples distinct from that one. It's not pure gratification. If, I'm, if I may briefly assume the role of the hypothesis that Eve followed the rules, I will be much happier to hear the news that Eve ate infinitely many apples apart from bad apple than to hear the news that Eve ate infinitely many apples. In the second case, I'm going to worry, well, did that include uh, bad apple? Um, OK, so switching from P and identity, that was the, the Humean notion of proportionality that had this notion of identity in the second clause, to P1 and this equivalent sub Y notion potentially helps in two ways. It helps with the problem of minimality. I mean, potentially, we haven't explained what this equivalence is yet, really. Um, uh, and when we do, you may still say we haven't really explained uh, what it is. Um, so it helps in two ways. One is with the minimality problem, but also with the hyperintentionality problem, because the, well, for the, because of the example that I just uh, gave, this notion of equivalent sub y is different from the notion, say, of equivalent sub y star if y star is necessarily equivalent to y. That isn't enough to make the equivalent sub y the same as equivalent sub uh, y star. So how, how do we get this notion of equivalent sub, sub y? How do we get to it from the hypothesis that, that y? Well, look again at this idea of y caring about the difference between x and x star. The caring is, of course, uh, metaphorical, but the about may not be. Um, so let's see where we can go with trying to, to, to sort of um, impose some structure on this notion of being about or sort of noticing, so to speak, the difference between x uh, and x star. Um, so aboutness, as um, defined a while ago by David Lewis, um, is the relation that a sentence bears to certain subject matters. I write them boldface, uh, uh, lowercase m. Uh, so never mind for now what subject matters um, are. Whatever they are, there are two separate questions you can ask about a hypothesis y and a world w. One is, is y true in w? The other is, is y true about that subject matter in w? And the answer may well be different. So many falsehoods may still be true about a given subject matter. And the person who made this point more clearly than anybody is, is uh, Nelson Goodman in this um, uh, old paper uh, uh, with Joseph Olian called Truth About Jones. It's, it involves, I don't even know the story. Anyway, so it involves like, a, so there's this, uh, Jones is on trial and his, uh, his defense attorney is, uh, he has this funny name. It's like a, a, a Marx Brothers kind of name. Jones. Uh, yeah, no. Anyway, so there's this guy, there's this, uh, that was just, I remember what it is. I was just testing to make sure nobody knew the story. Uh, uh, oh, uh, anyway, anyway. Anyway, so, 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 so the defense attorney has got to concede the following. So Jones is this witness. Sorry, Jones is on trial. OK. Uh, the chief witness for the defense gives testimony that is about Jones. And the attorney has to grant it's that, that, that testimony is false. So it's looking bad for Jones, right? The main uh, 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 witness for the defense speaks about Jones, and he says something false, OK? So then in the, in the Goodman story, the, the attorney says, um, I grant you that that testimony was about my client Jones. And I grant you that it was false. But I insist it was not false about Jones. And then pandemonium ensues, and the judge like, clears the courtroom and says, you know, you better like, explain that contradiction to me by Monday, or you know, your client is going down the river or up the river. Uh, and, and of course, it's pretty clear what might have happened. The, the, say the, 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 um, it might be that the, that the witness said, uh, Jones and Smith are both stand-up guys. Well, Smith is not a stand-up guy, 
But that shouldn't be a problem. So, 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 so the, the witness spoke falsely because of what he said about Smith. But that should not be a problem uh, when it comes to the w witness's testimony about Jones. He was right about that. Jones is a stand-up guy. I do not know the fine details of what counts as good testimony. I admit it could look bad uh, if the witness is, is lying about one person, etc. But the point is, the witness can say something false and speak about Jones without speaking falsely about Jones. And that's sort of the... the, the um, the, um, uh, what's the word? It's sort of the paradigm of how truth about a certain matter is, is a weaker condition, easier to meet than, than, than truth in its entirety. And that's the notion that I'm proposing to, to, um, to employ here. So, what is it? So, there's this difference between why being true in W and why being true in W, where a certain subject matter is concerned. So we know from, from the hyperintentionality problem that truth in the same world is not enough for the kind of equivalence that uh, we want in um, what I call P1, which is the improvement, the, the second stage, trying to improve Hume's notion of proportionality. So E does not, not work pretty clearly. X is equivalent to x prime, sub y, or modulo y, if and only if they're true in the same world. That's not what you want. What you want is they're true, in, they're true about a certain subject matter in the same world. Which subject matter? I'm just going to write lowercase boldface y that for the subject matter of y. Okay, so what you really want is to plug what I've called e sub y into p1, and you get the following p2. x is proportional to y if and only if x suffices for y. And for all x prime that are part of x that are sufficient for y, x prime is not true in the same worlds as x. That just leaves us with all our problems. It's true about this subject matter in the same worlds as x. And now I've got a, so now I'm racking up a lot of debts. I've, you know, I'm using this notion of subject matter and truth about a subject matter. I've got to have to say a little bit about it. Uh, not enough that you won't want to come back uh, tomorrow when, when more will be uh, revealed. But, so what are subject matters, and what in particular is the subject matter of a sentence Why? So subject matters at their simplest, and this is what uh, Lewis says, they're partitions of logical space. That is, they're carvings up of the set of all worlds into disjoint, exhaustive um, subsets. So I'm, 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 I'm just sort of breezing through that, assuming that people aren't sort of quietly gagging at this notion of logical space. It doesn't matter. We don't gag at MIT. You shouldn't gag for, for a few minutes here either. Um, uh, so, uh, so subject matters are partitions of logical space. These subsets, the, the cells of the subject matter, are the possible states of things where the subject matter is concerned. So Lewis's example is the number of stars. That's a subject matter. It groups worlds together if and only if they have equally many stars. So the possible states of things where the number of stars is concerned are there are exactly k stars where k is one, two, three. I'm assuming that no stars doesn't count as a number of stars. So there are exactly k stars for k is 1, 2, 3, maybe up into, into, into uh, infinity as well. So there's a diagram on the right. E1 is the set of one star worlds. E2 is the set of two star worlds. A says, this is just the example that, actually I found the diagram first, so I made up an A that kind of fits it. Uh, A says, there are two to four stars, at least one purple. Um, that's what A says. And um, it's not true in all the worlds where there are between two and four stars, because some of those worlds, none of the stars are purple. But the little purple circle you see there is the worlds where there are at least two to four stars, uh, where at least one is, is, is purple. Now consider, and, yeah, and so, and so that's where A is true. But where is A true about the subject matter of how many stars there are? Well, that subject matter doesn't care about the color, so A is true about how many stars there are, the number of stars, throughout E2, E3, and E4. Okay, so what makes A withhold its uh, consent, so to speak, to all the other worlds in E2, E3, and E4 is that there aren't purple stars in those, in those worlds, but that's an objection that is lapses if the subject matter is how many stars there are if we're no longer evaluating sentences with a view to the colors of the stars. Um, so um, so let me just sort of give a few equivalent ways of describing what it is for 
a sentence A to be true about the number of stars in a certain world W, it should be true, period, in a world with the same number of stars as W. So it might be false in W, but you can morph it into a, you could morph W into a world where A is true without mucking with things where the number of stars is concerned. So here's a world with three yellow stars. Uh, that does not make A true, but it's still true about the number of stars because I could take one of those stars and make it purple. I will not have changed things where the number of stars is concerned, and now I'll have a world where it literally is true that, that, that uh, where A is literally true. There are between two and, four star, two and four stars, at least one purple. So another way of explaining A is true about the number of stars is A is not, colon, false in W purely on account of how many stars there are there. That is, so the world might reject A, but it doesn't reject it on this basis. W's objection to there are two to four stars, at, at least one of which is purple, is not that's the wrong number of stars. It's a different objection. Um, A could have been true compatibly with the number of stars in W. That's another way of putting it. Or similar, I mean, more simply, W is just in the union of E2, E3, E4. W has two to four stars. Now take A prime. A prime differs from A. It says there are two to four stars, at least one yellow. So you can see it partly overlaps A on the second diagram, partly not. It's a subset of E2, E3, and E4. Uh, they overlap where there's at least one yellow star and at least one purple star, then the, the outlying A prime worlds, the outlying sort of yellow worlds are, where there's only uh, yellow stars, not, not purple ones. And so you see the, the picture. So these hypotheses, A prime and I, they're, and A, they're really not equivalent. You can see they don't carve out the same portion of logical uh, uh, space, but they're true about how many stars there are in the same worlds, which is the same as saying the same cells of this subject matter contain A worlds as A prime worlds. So if all you're interested in is which of these cells gets kind of uh, hit by A versus A prime, the same cells get hit by A as get hit by, by um, A prime. So at some point we need to say what these cells are, that is what are the possible states of things where a subject matter is concerned. But we can go a certain, base, uh, certain distance just on the basis of intuition. Um, his praise is sung infinitely many days is about how many days his praise is sung. So if we let um, um, x be his praise is sung every day from here on out, and x prime be his praise is sung every day from April 15th, 12,016 on out, Let's now apply the, the condition P2 that we just uh, described a little bit further up on the page. What was, does it take for X, his praise is sung every day, to be proportional to his praise is sung infinitely many days? Well, first of all, every day had better suffice for infinitely many days. It does, assuming as, as we are that there are infinitely many days in the future. Second, his praise is sung every day from 12,016 on out is true in the same worlds as it's sung every day from here on out where the number of days his praise is sung is concerned, which is also true. So worlds are alike with respect to how many days his praise is sung, if and only if his praise is sung infinitely many, sorry, equally many days in both of them. But in both of these worlds, it's sung countably many days. So that's the same infinite uh, uh, number. Now this might seem to be, mm, okay, I'm going to, Uh, I'm going to go very quickly through the next section. Just pretend I didn't if it doesn't make any sense. So to, to um, uh, dig deeper into, um, uh, to show you even more of my religious learning, you might, have, you might have wondered what Blake was getting at when he talked about uh, infinity in a grain of sand and eternity in an hour. Um, let's suppose, just, just, let's just postulate if you can with me that, um, what Blake had realized in some mystical vision is that the true days are actually what we call moments. And so there are, in fact, uncountably many days. Okay. What we call days, I write them in this sort of archaic looking language, days, that's archaic days, what we thought of as days before reading uh, uh, Blake. Now, 
suppose, just on this hypothesis, that every moment is a day. Now, if we say God's praise is sung every day, meaning every moment, that no longer is a good uh, uh, sort of truth maker for God's praise is sung infinitely many days because it's an unnecessarily large infinite number. You only needed countably many days. You didn't need uncountably. And so what I'm trying to say here is that just because we're now kind of trying to coarsen the notion of equivalence so that it only is equivalence where a certain subject matter is concerned doesn't mean that we've made it completely trivial because it's still important. Subject matter is how many days uh, his praise is sung and uncountably many days is a different many days than countably many uh, days. Okay, so just, to, just uh, ignore that. So now I'm going to mention a problem and some issues, and, these, and then we'll be done. Uh, the problem is, um, what is the subject matter of a sentence? Why? So P2, our last attempt to explain what proportionality is, relies on this notion. David Lewis said that why is wholly about a subject matter M if and only if its truth value never varies between M equivalent worlds. So a sentence is wholly about the number of stars. If it's true in one world with so many stars, it's true in every world with that many stars. It doesn't draw finer distinctions, so to speak, than the subject matter uh, itself does. The problem with, so another way to put it is, the truth value of Y supervenes on which cell you're in of the subject matter uh, M. The problem with this is that uh, it doesn't give you unique subject matter for a sentence to be about. It's true about lots of subject matters. So, so uh, 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 we sing infinitely many days is true about, for example, the subject matter of the two cell subject matter of whether we sing infinitely many days. That's not a very interesting one. Okay, so something has to be done to sort of explain what is the subject matter of why the one that it's exactly about, the one that groups worlds together if and only if they are relevantly simmer, similar from the perspective of why. Okay, and now here is the point where someone might wonder, there's that word relevant, okay? Isn't relevance what we're trying to explain? So isn't there a danger of circularity uh, here when we say, look, the subject matter we want, the subject matter that Y is exactly about is the one that groups worlds together if they're relevantly similar. Is that going to be, uh, is that going to dog our steps and destroy the whole, the whole thing? And that's one of the things we'll talk about next time. I want to now raise uh, a few issues that might also come about next time and will just be sort of toyed with and not satisfactorily dealt with. So one is this. According to H, the, the Humean idea about uh, relevance meaning being part of a proportional condition, <coughs> Z is helpful if it's part of a proportional Y, proportional X. But parts can earn their keep in different ways. <coughs> so a proportional X may contain, along with the helpful bits, something to ensure that the helpful bits do indeed suffice. So for example, something to ensure that Y doesn't get too big so that X indeed suffices for Y. So here's an example <coughs> taken from the literature on uh, moral particularism, this is pretty much 80% of what I know about the literature. It contains this example. So uh, that I promise to show up is part of why I should be here. Okay. Now what about the fact that the promise wasn't coerced? Okay. Is that also part of why I should be here? Well, you might well think, well, it's part of a minimal sufficient condition for I should be here. It's important that the promise wasn't coerced but not because it's part of why I should be here. Rather, it defeats a potential defeater of, uh, of uh, my promise um, in its role as helping it to be the case that I should be here. Another kind of example that, that uh, I kind of like is, think about what does it take for, what, what, how does the world have to be for, uh, for it to contain rocks? Well, a rock is you know, a contiguous body of rocky stuff. But that's not enough because there are some contiguous bodies of rocky stuff that are inside larger contiguous bodies of rocky stuff of the very same kind, and those don't count as rocks. Rocks are not made of infinitely many little rocks obtained by, yeah. So, so a rock is like a, a continuous, contiguous region of rocky stuff with, let's just say, some air around it. Now, what is the truth maker for there are rocks? Well, a sufficient condition is going to have to mention both the rocky stuff 
and that there's air around it, or non-rocky stuff around it. But you might argue that the rocky stuff is, plays a different role. It's part of why it's true that there are rocks. That there's air around it is not part of why it's true that there are rocks. Rather, it defeats the unhelpful uh, suggestion that maybe uh, it's only part of a larger bunch of rocky stuff. So that's supposed to be like an unmoral kind of analog uh, uh, to the notion of the, the, the role that uh, it's not being a coerced uh, promise. Um, OK, so second problem. There's a kind of euthyphro puzzle here, which I really won't say anything about, but I think is really interesting. Does x suffice thanks to its helpful parts, z included? Or is z helpful because it, in the right company, uh, suffices? Um, third, helpfulness, as explained in H, is highly extrinsic and circumstantial. It's holistic in a way that is sometimes thought to argue for moral or epistemological or whatever area you like particularism. So z may be helpful to y qua part of x, but helpful to uh, not y qua part of other conditions. And indeed, not z may be helpful to y qua part of uh, some other condition besides uh, x. So here's, here's, here's so another way to put the problem is, the way I've defined helpfulness, z can only be helpful to x if it's part of a proportional condition. Proportional condition suffices for y. So that means z can never be helpful to y unless y obtains. So there's no notion here of z being helpful to a, def to a cause that doesn't win out in the end, whereas we might well think that z can be helpful to y even if it wasn't enough help, so to speak. y didn't quite make it to being true, but it's not z's fault. z did its best. We have no account of that uh, uh, so far, nor are we likely to get one, but I'm just going to sort of talk about that a bit next time. Um, so these are difficult issues. Uh, my main suggestion is that people working on them maybe ought to be talking to people working on subject matter and ways and vice versa. They're not completely disconnected. Why do I say this? Well, one reason is that several types, well, we've got this notion of in situ helpfulness. Several types of helpfulness, including that one, but a bunch of other ones, can be disentangled using roughly our existing uh, uh, machinery. And indeed, this can be done in very simple settings, including propositional logic. Um, analogs of some of the phenomena that drive people towards particularism, uh, including this sort of helpful versus enabling, con helpful conditions versus enabling conditions, can also uh, arise in very simple semantic settings as well. These analogs that I'm going to describe next time don't seem especially deep in the way that, say, the particularism debate is meant to be deep, I infer from the kinds of words that are employed in the papers on this debate. Um, the question thus arises, what more might be wanted by particularists and their opponents than the notions that we are able to fabricate in the logic lab? And that's as far as we're going to get next time that question arises. My goal is not to say anything about it, but just to get some tools going for thinking about this stuff, incredibly crude tools. But the tools will also have other things to recommend them, which I'll describe next time. So I'm done. Okay, so, all right. So, how is a um, how is a subject matter determined? It can't just be sort of there can't just be a function from sentences to subject matters because it looks like what subject matter you want depends on certain kinds of things. Um, and okay, and so you said yeah, that's right. And so um, subject matters are going to be determined relative to something like a question under discussion. Um, S something like that. But then isn't a question under discussion just a subject matter? Um, so th it's, it, there seems to be something circular about that. I, I don't know if you're going to talk about this t tomorrow. Um, but but the, does that question make sense? Uh, yeah. OK. Uh, yeah, so the, let me just re re repeat the, yeah, the yeah, first yeah. part, and hopefully people have forgotten the second part. Yeah. <laughs> so so, so, the, the, so I'm, I, I'm talking about. First of all, there's like a, a general notion of sort of subject matters as sort of things in themselves, which for Lewis are, you know, partition, partitions of, of logical s space. Then there's this separate question, which is which are the subject matters of particular sentences? So what are sentential subject matters? That's a much trickier question. And 
and uh, a point that uh, Matt uh, uh, raised the other day was um, subject matters can actually, a sentence's subject matter isn't obviously a fixed thing, but depending on uh, what else is going on in the conversation might, that might change the subject matter. And, and uh, this probably doesn't, doesn't mean uh, much at this point. One of the aspects of context that can be relevant to what the subject matter of a sentence is is the so-called question under discussion. So when, 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 when linguists talk about questions, they too mean usually partitions of logical space. So it's the same kind of entity as uh, the subject matter of a sentence. But beyond that, um, uh, I mean, I don't, there isn't the same pro, for, 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 for the linguist, you know, it's, questions are just individuated by what the partition is. So uh, I suppose there is a question of how did that interrogative sentence manage to express that question, but not, that's not the centerpiece of, 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 of like what people are, are interested in in linguistics, as far as I understand it. Anyway, um, I will talk about that. Let me just give one, I will talk about that a little bit more next time, but let me just give one example of how the, the subject matter can, can change. And this is an example that goes back to Strassen. I think I mentioned this last time, so, you know, uh, you know, so Strassen, of course, famously said that, that you know, uh, definite descriptions, um, if, if they're not, if, if, uh, you know, presuppose that there is a thing which is F, you say the F, that presupposes there is a thing which is F. Um, if that isn't the case, then um, the sentence, like in the king of France is bald, then the sentence doesn't really express the proposition and it can't be evaluated. That's what he said initially. But then he noticed that, actually this is a funny historical fact. You have to look around pretty hard to find a sentence like the king of France is bald with the sentence, with the word the king of France in it that doesn't seem invaluable. Like the vast majority of them, well, I shouldn't say that. I mean, it's, you know, a whole lot, of, like if I, so, you know, if I say, well, he, Strassen makes this point, that even the king of France is bald suddenly seems invaluable if uh, someone says, hey, who are some, this is his phrase, bald notables. Who are some, yeah, that's his gift for ordinary language coming out. Like, people always say this, what are, who are some bald, bald notables? And, uh, and, and then I say, well, the king of France is bald. Well, now it seems false, right? So somehow, so, so what Strassen might, might say is, suddenly when you ask that question, this, the, the sentence is now about the bald notables, of whom there are some, let's suppose. So that gives you sort of a thing in the world for the sentence to be about, which it misdescribes, whereas out of context, King of Francis Bald isn't about anything in the world. So that's the kind of thing that shifts in subject matter. But for the point of view of like most of what we're talking about here, that won't that won't be important. I mean, it, you know, yeah. So your question is not important. Thank you, though. So this is. So this is about the, the potential circularity that you, you mentioned towards the end. So here's what I'm curious about. Suppose that uh, you said nothing to try to explicate the notion of relevance that, uh, that is needed to, um, to, to, to talk about worlds that are relevantly similar. I assume that it would, it would nonetheless be true that the proposal you have on the table so far uh, imposes constraints on the notion of relevance that you want to characterize. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what constraints you get. In, in other words, I'd like to know more about um, how much we get from your proposal, uh, even if nothing more is said about uh, the, the latter notion of relevance. should have an answer to this. Um, well, so I guess I, I guess um, I don't know exactly how to answer that in its own terms, but I can point to some other notions that are connected to subject matter that sort of impose theoretical pressures 
on what so, so I, I'm taking your question and sort of letting it be, a, a, rather, than, rather than saying, well, I'm taking your question and letting it be sort of about what is the relation between what counts as relevance in a subject matter and, 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 other, and other notions. Uh, um, and uh, uh, so, I mean, well, what, one, thing, one thing that I'll talk about a little bit uh, uh, Ne next time is that there's there's a clear notion of uh, one subject matter being a part of another subject matter, and if you think about it in terms of partitions, you know, uh, uh, one partition includes another if it sort of subdivides the cells of the other, and so that notion of one subject matter being part of another, then I think plays into a bunch of things, uh, and so this are, these are data points that could c help constrain what what how relevance is to be understood. Like so, for example, you, you'll get things like, uh, well, uh, one hypothesis is part of another if it's implied by the other, and its subject matter is included in that of the other. And, that, you know, and then we have intuitions about which hypotheses are part of other hypotheses. And one way of testing those is, is this hypothesis partly true on the basis of the fact that this thing uh, is wholly true? And so, all I'm saying is that you can get some productive dialogue going between these notions of, of subject matter and of, of relevance that, and, and other things. The other, the other thing is, um, um, so far we've just got the word relevance. It could just be a pun. You know, and the way I say it, the relevantly uh, similar. It isn't obvious that the notion of being relevantly similar is the same notion of relevance as the one that goes into keeping irrelevant stuff out of, say, causes or something like that. So, um, so that's another reason I'm not completely worried about the, the circularity. But uh, I think I've gone on long enough not answering your, your, your question. I have to think about that, yeah. So, like a follow-up. Um, so Sally pointed out the circularity so, uh, uh, a few days ago. And so I, I felt, you know, it does, it's not real, but I felt I should mention it, you know. <laughs> so this is. Um, oh, is it on? Is it on? Yeah. Okay, it's on. So, so your notion, as you said, you're allowing X and Y to be, you know, you're not defining what you mean, what the domain of X and Y are. It's very broad. It could be truths. It could be reasons. It could be facts. It could be events. It could be all sorts of things. And so that makes me think that suffices is, um, uh, well, polysemous, ambiguous, something, because you're going to have different kinds of sufficiency for these different kinds of things. So then in your, in your uh, notion of suffices, it seems to me that you need suffices in the relevant way. Mm. So because if you don't, if you suffice in the wrong way, that's not going to work. So there's another place where relevance comes back in, sneaking back in. Uh, I, I'm just looking back at a lifetime of sufficings in the wrong way. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that just sort of seems. You don't to, think there are sufficings? Uh, in no, no, no. I no, I don't. No, that's that. That's definitely true. So, so um, again, I'm not going to be able to, to, to answer this quite. But the definitely, I mean, so one kind of sufficing is necessarily. If x obtains, then y obtains. Another kind might be sort of like, in the case of causation, maybe nomologically uh, sufficing. In the case of reasons, there might be nothing like that. It might be if these are the only considerations uh, in play, then that, then those would make this action reasonable. But there's always the possibility that they would be crowded out by other stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm so far not completely seeing why these different ways of sufficing would. I think I could sort of explain at least some of the variety there without mentioning. I mean, the word relevance comes in, but I'm not sure it's the same kind. The word relevance. Maybe closer than that other kind of relevance that oh. was sneaking around. I see. Yeah. So all the way back, in the back behind Brett. Yeah. Thank you. Um, could I ask a question about the Euthyphro puzzle? I know you wanted to kind of blow right past it. Yeah. But um, so there's a question of whether the helpful contribution is more basic than the sort of product of the helpfulness. You know, sort of is a causal contribution more fundamental than um, 
than the causing itself. And so, so one sort of, one, one thing that like, uh, you, you might think, helpful, here's a good reason to think that a helpful contribution is more fundamental. There might be a helpful contribution that loses, so yeah. that, that fails to suffice, not just on its own, not just, yeah, but you know, there's, it totally fails to suffice because nothing suffices. So um, example might be, so that it would give me a reason to apologize later is usually not a very, I mean, it's a reason to do something because apolo you know, successful apologies are enriching and you, know, you repair relationships, but you know, it's not a reason to take your dog or deface your, your, your house or something. Um, but it's nevertheless, it seems like it does sort of help the cause of, you know, I have some reason to deface the house. Um, so I was just wondering, m my, uh, I'm wondering what you thought about the, the possibility of insufficient but nevertheless uh, helpful or hurtful yeah. contributions. Yeah, indeed, that's, that's what the, the, um, that's what the, the third issue was supposed to be. You know, can Z sometimes count in favor of X, even if X doesn't ultimately carry the day? So do we need as well a notion of default or per se, or you know, I don't even know all the different possible words are, are here. But I, what I want to suggest is you can at least go some distance towards explaining the sort of fighting valiantly in a lost cause stuff still treating helpfulness as a derivative from sufficiency, which is something like this. You might, so consider all the sufficient conditions that this thing, you know, for why or not why, that this thing could have been part of. Uh, maybe the vast majority of them, so, so the vast, maybe the vast majority of conditions sufficiently for having, sufficient for having behaved well uh, include, uh, uh, didn't kill anyone, although there might be cases where didn't, uh, c you know, killing someone is, is really important to having behaved well or something like that. So, so it's not completely, you know, there's at least room to explore the possibility that you could, you could um, uh, jack this in situ kind of helpfulness up into something more of the more contributory kind by just doing statistics on the different sorts of sufficient conditions that, that this thing could be, could be part of, and which way do they, which way do they uh, uh, push. That seems a little superficial, so it's just right for me. Yeah, <laughs> but, 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 but yeah, no, I, I, yeah. And, and the other thing, too, is, you know, it could be that in nearby, it's unusual in nearby worlds for you know, pleasure to figure in a sufficient basis for something to have been the wrong thing to do. What does that mean? Of course, it can't Im involve cardinality considerations. It, 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 there's going to have to be some kind of partition that comes into play. There's, you know, there, there, there's got to be some way of imposing sort of structure. So I'm not saying this is ultimately the, the, the right way to go. You know, maybe it'll turn out that there's some, there's some helpful considerations that are only ever thwarted they ne it's not even possible for them to succeed, you know, or be, you know, and then, then what I'm suggesting wouldn't, wouldn't work at all. But anyway, that's the kind of issue, yeah. So I know you said earlier, is this on? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I know you said earlier um, that you weren't worried about like the King of France type examples where maybe our intuitions about aboutness get to be super fine grain. Um, but I was wondering if that's if that's maybe a bigger problem. So you know, it's very easy for me to think that Hesperus is phosphorus. That's about Hesperus. Phosphorus is Hesperus. No, okay, that's about yeah, yeah. phosphorus. Um, I can totally see that if you wanted to get, um, leverage your theory of aboutness into a theory of, say, causation, um, it'd be really good to have all that mind-dependent stuff that goes into my intuitions about aboutness screened off. Um, but I was wondering if um, the notion of aboutness that I have is just so deeply mind, de uh, mind dependent, at least intuitively, that in order to draw the right kinds of distinctions between the mind dependent component and the stuff that's useful for causation, it's by well having a theory of causation, for instance, mm -hmm. and the causally relevant features of a situation, so that I know that um, here are some aspects of my intuitions of aboutness, or intuitions about aboutness, that I can jet 
jettison. Um, and so I was wondering if there's a cons if there's a different kind of circularity worry in the offing. So, so two two thoughts about that. Um, so so it sounds like at least part of the question is um, there are some. I'm sort of wheeling about in this in to, so to make it a factor in things that you might have wanted to be mind independent and uh, depending on uh, the, the the sort of the ways that context say. I, mean, I don't know why context and mind should be, should mean the same thing, but they seem to in this setting. Uh, depending on like how fragile say the the uh, these issues about what, you know. What's the subject matter of of a sentence? Are that that could have like bad deflationary consequences about say causation or something like that. And so I'm kind of torn two ways, you know, uh, about this. On the one hand, uh, the one issue is like just fine grainedness, you know. And so subject matter can sort of introduce a much greater degree of fine grainedness than you, than you. Than you'd normally expect to have, and, and and then it might have the result that in some of the cases that I mentioned, that causation would become more fine-grained than you might have thought. You might think, well, can a real relation in the world be hyper-intentional? I mean, how can like you know this causing that depend on differences between things that don't manifest themselves even in the thing's whole like trans-world uh, career? So that kind of consequence. I'm 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 willing to, you know, accept it potentially that, say, causation is that spooky, spooky in that way. <laughs> uh, whether we want to say that, uh, yeah, you're, you're pointing to a greater degree of spookiness, and I don't know exactly what what to say about that. But th the other thing is, y you might just think that. You know, the relata of causation are, uh, you know, suppose you write it in because terms, are like what I call directed propositions, things with subject matters built into them. In which case, you'd still have, it could still be completely objective. What would be not objective is which directed propositions a given sentence expresses in, in, in context. That would be one way of trying to address it. So, gentlemen, to right in front of one row up. Um, this is actually also about causation, something that you just said now uh, might answer my question. But I, but I was just thinking that, um, you know, as you m mentioned, uh, minimality is also often seen to be sort of a requirement for, for full causation. But then we can come up with sort of variants of your examples uh, to, to give counterexamples for that. For, so, for example, we can think of sort of a, uh, a fractal detector that sort of flies a light goes off uh, uh, if if it detects a fractal and and um, and so there w you know so we can like go through the same reasoning to s say that like any part of the fractal is is not minimal enough uh, uh, for to be the full cause of the of the f for the light to go off um, but I was thinking that um, the relata of causation are events and events don't have any aboutness properties. Um, so I was just worried about the, the, the how 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 far you can take uh, your kind of uh, fix for the problem. When I get around to to saying what aboutness properties are, it it might well turn out that they have the moral equivalent. Of aboutness properties, because aboutness properties are going to have to do roughly with the, the ways in which something can be the case, and um, you might think that there are the same fine-grained distinctions among events uh, that could be captured in terms of the ways that they're able to be the case. So you might, you know, think to use this kind of traditional, typical kind of example that. Uh, uh, what, what one way for you know, suppose you're suppose you're like a Davidsonian and you think that shootings are killings, okay? Well, here's the reason to think not. One way that 
a killing can occur is, you know, takes the victim a long time to die. That's not a way for a shooting to occur. Okay, so you might think there are these sort of fine-grained distinctions among, among even among events. So what I would really hope to do actually is n not like have this like about this ghetto where this like really special stuff happens, but trying to like you know, to use a a, a phrase of Nancy. Cartwrights that makes people cringe and probably will today as well to have like a dappled world kind of uh, idea of it that, that, that we're interested in not just what happens but the ways in which it's liable to happen and things that are sort of concretely indiscernible may still differ in the way uh, you know th there's there's uh, so I'll give you I'll give you one other example that 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 uh, I can't remember this might come up you know, so so I'm, here's a possible theory of of part whole Relations. This has nothing to do with about. Actually, I make this very point against myself at a certain. You might say the following: Look, uh, suppose you know what intrinsic properties are. Then you could say x is part of y, just in case any way for x to change intrinsically uh, is or induces a way for y to change intrinsically. Uh, but, and that's that's going to be very similar to what I actually want to say about co content part. But then there's the thought: Well. Material objects don't have subject matters. That's that's okay. They have something with the same the same kind of structure. Yeah. So I'm still trying to get my head around the positive proposal P two on the top of page three, um, and I. This might just be a chance for you to, like, further explicate how it works, but it but. It just kind of feels a little too, it smells too intentional to me. It kind of feels a little, like, not quite hyper-intentional enough. Oh. Um, and um, one way, s I haven't quite gotten this to work out, so I don't actually have, like, a sharp counterexample or something, but I, so one p potential worry is if, if we choose our subject matter, like the, the bold Y, you know, lowercase, such that, it makes um, there only be one cell, or such that it makes there be a different cell for every possible world. <laughs> I feel like we lose all the structure yeah. you got. Right? Yeah. But surely we can come up with cases like so. Like you know, the subject matter could be something about the very logical machinery. You're, so so let the subject matter be like the number of possible worlds in logical space. Mm. Right. There's just one cell for that. Um, I see. You know, or if you're do, if you're deviating from S five, I can come up with some other example. Or make the set, make the subject matter be everything that's true in a given possible world, or something. I see. And then I, I haven't quite gotten a sentence that I can then get. With a, but I feel like once I do that, it could, then you can adapt some, the old counterexamples. Once you switch the subject matter such that we lose this machinery yeah. that you're using in order to avoid the old counterexamples. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, fortunately. This matter is too complicated to really be <laughs> addressed. Right. I mean, I, I I take the point, and this is one of the reasons that. Uh, so I've got a certain kind of hyper intentionality, but as you point out, it's sort of, it's got its limits because it's just like you know which part of the power set of yeah. the set of you know of a given set of worlds are you going to include, and uh, so this is the kind of reason that, say, someone like Kit Fine would prefer. To, to not do it in terms of possible, he would say very similar things to what I'm saying, but not in terms of possible worlds at all, but just have like a, a state space uh, mm -hmm. semantics where uh, uh, you kind of, there, there, there's not supposed to be some sort of single uh, semantic entity against which all the sentences are calibrated like they're supposed to be with. That, 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 you know, so you, you, give them a, you give them a different example like you just did, and you say, okay, well, I'll concoct. A state space that's sort of suitable for that, and then whether something, whether that's okay or not, uh, I don't know. But I, 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 uh, I take, I take the, uh, the, the point. You know, sort of, it's like a, there's a crisis of rising expectations that happens. I say, oh, I'm going to take on all these sorts of examples, and then you say, well, I can build similar examples, based on your very machinery, and that that that, that does seem right. And it might be a reason for thinking that. You don't want to have a, a sort of a, a single set of worlds as the ultimate thing you're calibrating everything against. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This is just another 
kind of circularity worry. It's the closeness of the idea of about to the idea of a subject matter. Yeah. Um, you say here aboutness is the relation a sentence S bears to certain subject matter M. And I feel like asking which relation. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, if my sentence is six words long, it bears a relation to six wordedness, but that's not what it's about. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't, I'm not helped by the addition that subject matter is a division of logical space or what, whatever. That doesn't. Wait, can you say that again? I, You're not. I, I don't. <laughs> you know, <laughs> identify the subject matter. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just. <laughs> the division of logical space that yeah, doesn't yeah, help me yeah, see yeah. why six wordedness is not what the sentence is about. Yeah. But Right, so so you so you're you're saying uh, to say that aboutness is a relation between sentences and these things called subject matters is not really saying anything yet. They, I you know I I I, I, I very much uh, agree with that. I mean something will have to be said about that. Um, there's a little bit you can say though, um, e even there, um, where, where the the relation between possible worlds can help, and this is sort of where, where David Lewis took it, you could say, look, uh, a sentence is, so I, I, I'm interested in this notion of exact aboutness, what is like the subject matter of the sentence, but you could have a weaker notion, which is, it's wholly about, it's not about anything else, so to speak, besides, and, 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 and one account you could give of that is, the sentence has the same truth value in any two worlds that are equivalent where that subject matter is concerned, so there are infinitely many stars is wholly about the number of stars uh, because there can't be two worlds with equally many stars, in one of which there's infinitely many, in the other one of which there isn't. But there are uh, uh, infinitely many stars um, which get bigger and bigger. That is not wholly about the number of stars. And, and there is a sort of a test for this, which is I can find two worlds that are just alike with respect to how many stars there are in them. One of them, they get bigger and bigger. The other one, they don't. So that shows the sentence is not wholly about that because it attends to distinctions that are finer than you would get from that partition. But that isn't saying much. So, so, so here, here's, what, here, here's where I think the situation is. So, 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 so Lewis's notion of wholly about is this sentence is not about uh, anything outside this subject matter. It's sort of, it's, it supervenes you know, on this. But that allows this to get as fine-grained as you like. It could be the, the, the partition that, that Salim described, where every world goes in, into its own cell. So there's, there's really two different notions. One is, uh, it's not about anything outside the subject matter. That's what, and the other is, there's not anything in the subject matter that it's not about. Right? So just like the ultimately fine-grained partition is, is not going to be good, because it just like buries the the relevant stuff and a bunch of irrelevant distinctions. And so, yeah, something will, will have to be. So on the one hand, I want to say, you can get a little bit, at least, you know, a technical condition out, out, of, out of this. But it doesn't get you, to, it only gets you to be wholly about. And exactly about is a further question. And I'll say a bit about that next time. Uh, but it, but it, will, uh, it will make heavy use of undefined notions. I'm not nimble enough to do possible worlds stuff myself, but is your notion of aboutness for a sentence going to remain sufficiently continuous with when we talk about what a book is about or what yeah. a movie is about? I mean, you know, suppose yeah. I say Casablanca is about friendship, but also about patriotism. You know, that kind of use of aboutness. Yeah. I, 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 some, I sometimes, probably, no. I mean, that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is the way everybody, the notion of aboutness that people, you know, there's like, so Ryle has a 1933 paper called About, and Goodman has a, I don't know, something, paper called About, and Putnam has some stuff about it too, and they're, they're all interested in the entities that, uh, well, and you're talking about something more general than entities, or the, you know, the, the, the types of the, that a sentence is, is about, and uh, that is the sort of notion that comes to mind. That probably is the English language notion of aboutness. And so this is different from that. I, I sometimes entertain hopes of trying to get some mileage out of this stuff. So, so 
some mileage uh, regarding the traditional uh, notion um, out, of, out of the sentential subject. So, so one idea might be, you know, so I say, there's a difference between no Fs are Gs and no Gs are Fs, even though they're logically equivalent. Now, someone might say, well, the first is about the Fs, and the second is about the Gs. And so one, one thing one might try here is to say, well, what the mark at the level of sentential subject matter that no Fs or Gs is about the Fs is that the way it's true changes when different things are F, but not necessarily when different things are G. So it's sensitive to changes in the population of F, but not that of G. And so then that might, see, I mean, semantics makes a lot of use of these notions of like, you know, topic and comment and what a sentence is really about. And, 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 and everybody knows that like, these are not just grammatical notions. It sort of depends on what's going on in, in, in context and so on and so forth. And so uh, I, sometimes, I sometimes, I dare hope of a notion of like, what a, a sentence is about that doesn't just sort of say, well, grammatically, you know, if you say the, you know, no Fs or Gs because the F appears in subject position, it's about the Fs. Because that can, that can change. It's really about your, your feeling of what, as you're sort of, as you're sort of like going through logical space of when this is true for different reasons. And, 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 and yeah. So I'm, I'm just going to ask, ask a, a follow up because when Chris started asking the question, I had a, a similar circularity worry. So um, when you're identifying a subject matter, um, if we identify it with a partition, um, one way to do that is to have an equivalence relation on worlds. And it won't do to to um, pick out the equivalence relation by saying, well, two worlds are equivalent in the way I have in mind, just in case any sentence that's about that subject matter is true in either both or neither, right? And what Lewis, in fact, did in certain canonical cases was independently specify the equivalence relation, like historical, you know, often in a way that required wheeling in some machinery. So you have a, a notion of, you know, of, of what's intrinsic to a region of space time, and that might allow you to say that a certain proposition is about history up to some time, just in case its truth value doesn't differ between worlds that are intrinsically alike yeah. in that stretch of history. So I'm just like, have this like vague worry that it, it's not gonna be the case that in every case where we have clear ideas about what a, a sentence is about, we're gonna be able to identify an equivalence relation in the appropriately independent way. Mm -hmm. So thoughts about that? Yeah. Like, well. I guess I have two thoughts that are very clear. Uh, one is that oftentimes, at least in semantics, you, you don't you don't have to do that. You know, in other words, so I mean, you know, when you say, you know, a, a sentence is ambiguous, it expresses different. There's different propositions it could express. You, you know, that itself is of some explanatory use, even if you sort of can't always say. In independent, I mean, it's you know, propositions have got infinitely many worlds in them. You got to you got to do something, and there's no reason to think, you know, given that not everything is analyzable, you're not gonna. Ha I mean, you're not always gonna have uh, an independent way of, of of saying which worlds go into a, a, a given cell or something like that. But the other thing is, um, what's wrong with that? I forgot. I forgot. What the other? Uh, but uh, but also, but. So there's maybe like three different there's three different possibilities. Sort of one is you can say in independent terms what the subject matter is, such that someone who never didn't understand the sentence, you could say, well, I can give you an understanding of that in part by explaining its subject matter to you, and then you can explain that in completely independent terms. That you know that for familiar reasons is probably too much to ask. Then there's the obscurantist end of it, where where you say, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. Uh, you know, this is about, it's about how mimsy the Borogoves were, or something like that, you know. Uh, uh, and then I'm hoping that there can be something uh, uh, in between, yeah. Uh, so this is, this is just a clarificatory question, um, and I mean that like really, it's not one of these like, there's a trap lying in wait somewhere. So, yeah. so, uh, the, the, the humane idea you have, you say, here's proportionality, and then you say being relevant or helpful or a reason is being part of something that's proportional. And so this is actually, I just kind of want to put you in dialogue with your earlier self. So, you know, in the analog, or there's 
cause is kind of analogous to reason. But back in the 90s, you were saying that causes were the things that are proportional, not that causes were parts of proportional conditions. Yes. So have you changed your mind, or do you, no, do you not do you, do you say, well, maybe reasons are parts of things that are proportional, but causes are, causes are not like that. Causes are the things that are proportional in the first place. Or is this asking too much? Yeah, no, no. You line up this, this, your yeah. with your no, Right. So, so in the 90s, I like to say things like this, which I, I still would like to say. And I, I admit it may not be the same notion of proportionality. It depends on how, how uh, loosey-goosey you want to get about sufficiency. But so I used to say things like, look, you know, uh, what, the event that caused Socrates' death was his drinking the hemlock, not his guzzling the hemlock. Let's suppose he's like a really messy drinker and he's like always made a mess. You know, you don't want to say, that still, uh, you know, it didn't have to, it would have been just as effective if he hadn't made a mess, maybe even more effective. Uh, uh, and so that was just a relation between events. And so, I, so for me, no one has ever accepted this, and so I don't talk about it much anymore. There's, there's these two essentially different events. There's his drinking the hemlock and his guzzling the hemlock. The, the, the second is essentially messy. The, the first is only accidentally uh, messy. And I used to say, well, C is proportional to, sorry, C is proportional to E. Part of that is um, uh, there shouldn't be a C minus that's sort of less than or equal to C, such that if C minus had occurred in C's absence, E would still have occurred. So the reason the guzzling isn't proportional is that there's this other thing, the, the drinking. Okay, uh, so here's a way you could, so that was just about events. This is, if anything, more about conditions or facts. Uh, here's a way you could do it. You could say, Here's a very weak notion of, uh, of, of, su of uh, sufficiency. Uh, well, you know, try to get some notion of sufficiency out of counterfactuals. So, you know, Lewis famously said, you know, if C had been the case, then E would have been the case. In his picture of things, that was trivial if C and E both occur, and so it didn't really have any teeth. So you could either say, well, let's have a theory of counterfactuals where it isn't trivial, that would be sufficiency. Or another thing that I toyed with was, suppose C hadn't occurred. Then if it had, E would have occurred. And rather take it away and put it back, and then see if E comes back with it. OK, that, that, that would be one way of, uh, 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 that, that could be a notion of sufficiency that would play nicely with the, with the old, the, the, you know, the, that, that would allow in things like Socrates guzzling the hemlock or is guzzling the hemlock and mopping his brow take that away and bring it back, and you're still going to die. And then, anyway, so that would be one, if, if someone was like fantastically interested in reconciling my current ideas that nobody cares about with my earlier ideas that nobody cares about, then that would be one approach that they, I would care about if they would try that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I have a question. Another question about proportionality, although it's not Diablo exegesis. Um, <laughs> no offense. <laughs> I'd like their question. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was just wondering about how, or just very generally about proportionality. So um, it seems to me that, that like, there are really sort of two competing explanatory virtues. Um, something like propor portability of of the explanation, or the explanation, I don't remember which is which. So, um, and, and proportionality is tracking sort of that virtue. So you say something like, um, why did this mental event, or sorry, why did, why did I do, th why did this, um, why did I do this thing, I don't know. And you explain it, well, you invoke mental causes, because those are supposed to be sort of, um, <laughs> no, suppose I, wa I, I want to know why, um, um, yeah, certain uh, mental event occurred, and I explain it in terms of uh, uh, something that's like a little bit lower down, but not like super low down, so not like the physical facts or anything. Um, and so I say, well, this 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 mental event occurred in, in virtue of blah blah blah, um, and. Um, that that sort of explanation is supposed to be sort of suppose that that that, that explanation is that the explanations in that case was proportional. It seems like um, 
the reason we like proportional explanations is that they're they're portable. We wanted to know why that sort of that an event of that kind occurred, and we don't want to go too low down for that because the that sort of low down stuff is going to be like extra information. But it yeah. seems on the other hand, there's like the explanatory virtue of some kind of explanatory virtue of, of depth, yeah. where we want to know not just why. Um, so often when we're w w we want to know not just why an event of a certain kind occurred, but why the event as it actually happened occurred. Yes. And in those cases, it seems like discovering um, the physical fact that physical facts are sort of the ultimate, the ultimate grounds of of the mental events are was an achievement. Yeah. And it was an explanatory achievement yeah. because we explain we learned what explained what. Um, okay, but then then you have violations of proportionality. So I wonder, yeah. I wonder, given that there are these two sort of competing virtues, the proportionality really only tracks one of them, namely this sort of ideal of portability. Yeah. Um, because you want your sort of explanations to generalize to other cases. But, in, but when you want to sort of, when you want a deeper explanation, you want to know more about how something actually occurred. Yeah. A and, and that's not going to be kind of, yeah. yeah. So I, I, I sort of agree with that, except for the sort of honorific tone of voice that you're using deeper in. But yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, right. So like a million years ago, I think I, I, had, I had a distinction between uh, uh, effect-driven causal judgments and world-driven causal judgments. So effect-driven causal judgments are sort of like supposed to just care about what the effect needed, with the idea being that those needs could have been met in various ways, and that gives you a certain kind of portability. Yep. And you get sort of broader generalization. You don't, you know, this is what people call. You don't want to miss generalizations because you went too, too low. And then, but then, so there's one question: is what did the effect need? And then the other is like, how did the world contrive to meet those needs? And those are both, those are both, uh, uh, legitimate uh, uh, questions. And it's true that, um, I mean, the part of proportionality that I'm emphasizing here is is totally about the, the portability or the as I used to put it, the, the steadier causal currents beneath. <laughs> um, uh, but there's another, but there's also another, there could potentially be another aspect uh, uh, to it, which is I use this notion of sufficiency as though it's like already in place, but you also could do some work there. You could say, well, you know, x is not really enough for y if y wouldn't have occurred if x had occurred in the absence of x plus or something like that. And, uh, and then, you know, you can get it to push both directions. It's probably easier to do it this way, and, but I, I accept that. Actually, it, for, it, th that's, that's actually um, kind of just like, here's a, like a, a pet peeve or something that, that, that I think what you just said is very relevant to. It's like, there's all this, you know, stuff about mental causation where people, you know, dislike the idea that wide content can be causally relevant because they say, oh, then you, you know, if you say that, you're missing generalizations because the person on twin earth who's thirsty, they reach for the water just as much as the person on earth who's, who, who's thirsty. And so therefore, to get a, a cause that, it seems like you should have the same cause both here and there, but if you say it's because they want water, then that's a different cause over there. And, and, and this seems to me like highly ironic in that we're trying to capture generalizations over people that one of whom doesn't exist, namely our <laughs> twin. But then we're missing generalizations over a bunch of people that do exist, namely everybody who wants water tries to get some, more or less regardless of the, <laughs> of the exact neural way in which that desire is implemented. So I think it's a, it's a funny turn. And this is the kind of thing that only philosophers could do. They say, look, we are so anxious to to not miss generalizations, that we're going to do this incredible thing that common sense doesn't do, so we don't miss the generalization between us and our twin earthling doppelgangers. You get so fixated on this that you sort of ignore your actual, yeah. like, er earthmates. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's how I refer to my friends. Earth <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. Um, so uh, as usual, I've been thinking about birds. Um, in particular, ravens and uh, whether they're all black and whether white shoes are evidence that they're all black. Um, and if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I remember you at one point um, suggesting that uh, the thing to say about 
the Raven's paradox, or one thing one might say is that um, all ravens are black and all non-black things are non-ravens, though equivalent have different subject matters. Yeah. And that black ravens uh, speak to the subject matter of all ravens are black in a way that white shoes don't. And um, So I basically this is just um, uh, an invitation to ask you to speak more about that. And in particular, of course, um, we want to accommodate the datum that uh, if I know that a, B, and C are the only white things. If I learn that they are white shoes, well, surely we want to say that uh, that's highly relevant to all ravens yeah. are black, and in fact, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just invitation yeah. to say more about No, OK. Yeah, no, I totally agree with this. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll say something that's sort of, uh, well, that's as much as, I, as I'm going to claim for it. I'm going to say it. <laughs> Uh, but so here, so one way of putting the, the, the thought is, if you think in probabilistic terms, I don't know if you ever do that. But <laughs> Try to avoid it, but can't, can't really help. But if you think in probabilistic terms, uh, uh, depending on your background information, you know, information about the, you know, whether the white things are ravens can be highly probabilistically, I mean, you can't deny, like, you know, probabilification doesn't care about the difference between all ravens are black and all non-black things are ravens. In this it's, it's intentional. Uh, so, so here's the kind of thing you'd have to say. Th there's two ways of raising something's probability. Uh, and I'll kind of exaggerate it a bit. Not, not that I know how to say it in an unexaggerated way. One way I think can, uh, uh, evidence can raise probability is the, hypothesis, the proposition actually expressed by the sentence is made more likely by this piece of evidence. The other way that the evidence can make uh, a sentence, say, likelier, is that it, lower, it, 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 it it changes our sense of how much the sentence is trying to say. So, my, so here, here's, what I, here's how I'm thinking of it. A black, you're right, depending on the background, black raven and white piece of paper could be equally probabilistically relevant. But the black raven, the way the white piece of paper comes in is it's a, dif it's a different, we lamer kind of confirmation. It's basically just, if you find a, a white piece of paper, you say, oh, well, so that puts an upper bound on what this sentence was saying. And so since it's saying less, there's that, it'll be that much more probable. So when you say, you know, so I say, all A's are B's. You find an A that's B, I want to say, uh, that's, I can't justify this, it's just a metaphor. That speaks to what the sentence was already, you know, it was already trying to be about the things that sort of happened to be A. When you find a thing that isn't B, and then you determine it isn't A, it's sort of like what I said about the coerced, uh, you know, the fact that the promise is coerced is not a further reason in favor of that you should do it. The fact that this white thing wasn't a raven is not a further reason why it's true. It simply um, uh, uh, defeats a defeat, a possible, uh, defeater, and the form that a defeater would take would be to say, this thing had, was about more objects than you might have thought. It was about this, this, this white thing as well. And then the answer is, no, it actually isn't about that. But that's just a different kind of, it's a different kind of probabilification, it feels to me. But so would, would it be accurate to say that um, you don't deny that both black ravens and white shoes confirm, you just think they confirm in distinctively different ways, and that accounts for why we have different reactions? Well, I, they both probabilify. Yeah, and of course it, d it depends completely on the on, on 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 the background. This is another like area where I, I think it would be really interesting to like try to link up the epistemological literature on uh, sort of I don't know per se reasons with with the moral literature about which I know almost exactly nothing. But so one thing people sometimes say about uh, like what does it mean to say that X is helpful to Y? And you know, or is a reason that favors whying or something like that. And say, well, if that were the only consideration in play, then it would, it would, it would. Then you should why. And and then the answer to that is, well, that never happens. It never happens that that's the only consideration in play. Well, well, Hempel does this exact same thing because he initially says anyway, well, if all you knew was that <laughs> this was a black raven or something, then you should be more. But, it, but of course, it rarely happens that all you know is that something is a, is a black raven. And so, uh, uh, so, and th this is another interesting thing I think about this example relative, relevant that's relevant to this kind of thing I'm trying to 
talk about is that when people say, oh, look, you know, there's no, there's nothing that's sort of per se helpful or per se rationalizing. It's very much like, you know, uh, so, so, I mean, you have this idea that, uh, there is this idea that like a black raven on balance is helpful to all ravens are black. And then someone like, you know, I.J. Good comes along, you know, and says, oh, I can tell you like some collateral beliefs you might have. And then if you see a black raven, you know, so, so the world is either one where there's visible black ravens, but there's some white ones that you never see, or there, or um, it's all, all the ravens are black, but you hardly ever see any. And then you see a black raven, you think, oh, I must be in the one with the white ones that I never, that I never see. And I just think it's interesting that, well, two things. Uh, uh, one is, uh, the evidence that you gain in that case is, of course, not just that here's a black raven. It's that I encountered a black raven on a random walk through the world, which is not, which then, you know, the, the, that's not supposed to be what the Eco's criterion is supposed to be about. It's the, the instance is supposed to be justifying, not the instance plus some other stuff. Um, but, but, um, but I just think it's interesting how much trouble, I mean, how hard it was for good to think of that, that kind of background that it took to make the black raven sort of count against. And what I was sort of alluding to a little bit in response to Daniel Munoz is, there ought to be some sense you can make of, yes, this thing, anything can count in favor of anything, but it takes a lot more trouble. You really got to work hard to find a context in which x counts against y instead of in favor. And so, I, so I'm, I'm inclined to sort of group the, the, the good kind of example together with the idea of, you know, a pleasure can actually be bad making if it's sadistic pleasure or something like that. You know, you have to reach around for sadistic pleasure. That's, you know, that, that could be misinterpreted. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, we're out of time. Apologies to the people who are still in the queue. Please join us for reception next door. And let's thank Steve for round one. Thank you. Thank you.